And now chapter 2, Lord Krishna in Indraprastha city. In the presence of the great sage Narad and all the other associates of Lord Krishna, Uddhava considered the situation and then spoke as follows. My dear Lord, first of all, let me say that the great sage Narad Muni has requested you to go to Hastinapur to satisfy King Yudhishthir, your cousin, who is making arrangements to perform the great sacrifice known as Raja Suya. I think, therefore, that your lordship should immediately go there to help the king in this great adventure. However, although to accept the invitation offered by the sage Narad as primary is quite appropriate, at the same time, my lord, it is your duty to give protection to the surrendered souls. Both purposes can be served if we understand the whole situation. Unless we are victorious over all the kings, no one can perform this Rajasuya sacrifice. In other words, it is to be understood that King Yudhishthir cannot perform this great sacrifice without gaining victory over the belligerent King Jarasandha. The Rajasuya sacrifice can be performed only by one who has gained victory over all directions. Therefore, to execute both purposes, we first have to kill Jarasandha. I think that if we can somehow or other gain victory over Jarasandha, all our purposes will automatically be served. The imprisoned kings will be released, and with great pleasure we shall enjoy the spread of your transcendental fame for having saved the innocent kings whom Jarasandha has imprisoned. But King Jarasandha is not an ordinary man. He has proved a stumbling block even to great warriors because his bodily strength is equal to the strength of 10,000 elephants. If there is anyone who can conquer this king, he is none other than Bhima Sain, because he also possesses the strength of 10,000 elephants. The best thing would be for Bhima Sain to fight alone with him. Then there would be no unnecessary killing of many soldiers. In fact, Jarasandha will be very difficult to conquer when he stands with his Akshohini or large divisions of soldiers. We may therefore adopt a policy more favorable to the situation. We know that King Jarasandha is very much devoted to the Brahmins and very charitably disposed towards them. He never refuses any request from a Brahmin. I think, therefore, that Bhima Sain should approach Jarasandha in the dress of a Brahmin, beg charity from him, and then personally engage in fighting him. And in order to assure Bhima Sain's victory, I think that your lordship should accompany him. If the fighting takes place in your presence, I am sure Bhima Sain will emerge victorious, for your presence makes everything impossible possible. Indeed, Lord Brahma creates this universe and Lord Shiva destroys it simply through your influence. Actually, you create and destroy the entire cosmic manifestation. Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva are only the superficially visible causes. Creation and destruction are actually performed by the invisible time factor, which is your impersonal representation. Everything is under the control of this time factor. If your invisible time factor can perform such wonderful acts through Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, will not your personal presence help Bhima Sain conquer Jarasandha? My dear Lord, when Jarasandha is killed, the queens of all the imprisoned kings will be so joyful at their husbands being released by your mercy that they will all sing your glories, as pleased as the gopis were 
when relieved from the hands of Shankasura. All the great sages, the king of the elephants, Gajendra, the goddess of fortune, Sita, and even your father and mother were all delivered by your causeless mercy. We also have been thus delivered, and we always sing the transcendental glories of your activities. Therefore, I think that if the killing of Jarasandha is undertaken first, that will automatically solve many other problems. As for the Rajasuya sacrifice arranged in Hastinapur, it will be held either because of the pious activities of the imprisoned kings or the impious activities of Jarasandha. My Lord, it appears that you are to go personally to Hastinapur to conquer demoniac kings like Jarasandha and Shishupal, to release the pious imprisoned kings, and also to perform the great Rajasuya sacrifice. Considering all these points, I think that your lordship should immediately proceed to Hastinapur. This advice of Uddhava's was appreciated by all who were present in the assembly. Everyone considered that Lord Krishna's going to Hastinapur would be beneficial from all points of view. The great sage Narad, the elderly personalities of the Yadu dynasty, and the supreme personality of Godhead, Krishna himself, all supported the statement of Uddhava. Lord Krishna then took permission from his father, Vasudev, and grandfather, Ugrasen, and he immediately ordered his servants, Daruk and Jaitra, to arrange for travel to Hastinapur. When everything was prepared, Lord Krishna especially bid farewell to Lord Balaram and the king of the Yadus, Ugrasen. And after dispatching his queens along with their children and sending their necessary luggage ahead, he mounted his chariot, which bore the flag marked with the symbol of Garuda. Before starting the procession, Lord Krishna satisfied the great sage Narad by offering him different kinds of worshipable articles. Naradaji wanted to fall at the lotus feet of Krishna, but because the Lord was playing the part of a human being, he simply offered his respects within his mind, and fixing the transcendental form of the Lord within his heart, he left the assembly house by the airways. Usually the sage Narad does not walk on the surface of the globe, but travels in outer space. After the departure of Narad, Lord Krishna addressed the messenger who had come from the imprisoned kings and told him that they should not be worried, for he would very soon arrange to kill the king of Magadha, Jarasandha. Thus he wished good fortune to all the imprisoned kings and the messenger. After receiving the assurance from Lord Krishna, the messenger returned to the imprisoned kings and informed them of the happy news of the Lord's forthcoming visit. All the kings were joyful at the news and began to wait very anxiously for the Lord's arrival. The chariot of Lord Krishna began to proceed accompanied by many other chariots along with elephants, cavalry, infantry, and similar royal paraphernalia. Bugles, drums, trumpets, conch shells, horns, and coronets all produced a loud, auspicious sound which vibrated in all directions. The 16,000 queens, headed by the goddess of fortune, Rukmini Devi, the ideal wife of Lord Krishna, and accompanied by their respective sons, all followed behind Lord Krishna. They were dressed in costly garments decorated with ornaments and their bodies were smeared with sandalwood pulp and garlanded with fragrant flowers. Riding on palanquins nicely decorated with silks, flags and golden lace, they followed their exalted husband, Lord Krishna. The infantry soldiers carried shields, 
swords and lances in their hands, and acted as royal bodyguards to the queens. In the rear of the procession were the wives and children of all other followers, and there were many society girls also following. Many beasts of burden, like bulls, buffalo, mules, and asses, carried the camps, bedding, and carpets, and the women who followed were seated in separate palanquins on the backs of camels. This panoramic procession was accompanied by the shouts of the people and was full with the display of different colored flags, umbrellas, and whisks, and different varieties of weapons, dress, ornaments, helmets, and armaments. Shining in the sunlight, the procession appeared just like an ocean with high waves and sharks. In this way, the procession of Lord Krishna's party advanced towards Hastinapur, now New Delhi, and gradually passed through the kingdoms of Anarta, now Gujarat province, Salvira, now Surat, the great desert of Rajasthan, and then Kurukshetra. Between those kingdoms were many mountains, rivers, towns, villages, pasturing grounds, and mining fields. The procession passed through all these places in its advance. On his way to Hastinapur, the Lord crossed two big rivers, the Drishvati and the Sarasvati. Then he crossed the province of Panchala and the province of Matsya. In this way, he ultimately arrived at Indraprastha. The audience of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is not very commonplace. Therefore, when King Yudhishthir heard that Lord Krishna had arrived in his capital city, Hastinapur, he became so joyful that all his hairs stood on end in great ecstasy, and he immediately came out of the city to properly receive the Lord. He ordered the musical vibration of different instruments and songs, and the learned Brahmins of the city began to chant the hymns of the Vedas very loudly. Lord Krishna is known as Rishikesh, the master of the senses, and King Yudhishthir went forward to receive him exactly as the senses meet the consciousness of life. King Yudhishthir was the elder cousin of Krishna. Naturally, he had great affection for the Lord, and as soon as he saw him, his heart became filled with great love and affection. He had not seen the Lord for many days, and therefore he thought himself most fortunate to see the Lord present before him. The king therefore began to embrace Lord Krishna again and again in great affection. The eternal form of Lord Krishna is the everlasting residence of the goddess of fortune. As soon as King Yudhishthir embraced him, he became free from all the contamination of material existence. He immediately felt transcendental bliss and merged in an ocean of happiness. There were tears in his eyes and his body shook in ecstasy. He completely forgot that he was living in this material world. After this, Vimasen, the second brother of the Pandavas smiled and embraced Lord Krishna, thinking of him as his own maternal cousin, and thus he was merged in great ecstasy. Bhima Sain also was filled with ecstasy that for the time being he forgot his material existence. Then Lord Sri Krishna himself embraced the other three Pandavas, Arjun, Nakul, and Sahadev. The eyes of all three brothers were inundated with tears, and Arjun embraced Krishna again and again because they were intimate friends. The two younger Pandava brothers, after being embraced by Lord Krishna, fell down at his lotus feet to offer their respects. Lord Krishna thereafter offered his obeisances to the Brahmins present as well as to the elderly members of the Kuru dynasty, like Bhishma, Drona, and Dhritarashtra. 
There were many kings of different provinces, such as Kuru, Srinjaya, and Kakaya, and Lord Krishna duly reciprocated greetings and respects with them. The professional reciters, like the Suttas, Magadhas, and Vandinas, accompanied by the Brahmins, offered their respectful prayers to the Lord. Artists and musicians, like the Gandharvas, as well as the royal jokers, began to play their drums, conch shells, kettle drums, veenas, merdungas, and bugles, and they exhibited their dancing art to please the Lord. Thus the all-famous Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, entered the great city of Hastinapur, which was opulent in every respect. While Lord Krishna was entering the city, all the people talked amongst themselves about the glories of the Lord, praising His transcendental name, quality, form, and so on. The roads, streets, and lanes of Hastinapur were all sprinkled with fragrant water through the trunks of intoxicated elephants. In different places of the city, there were colorful festoons and flags decorating the houses and streets. At important road crossings, there were gates with golden decorations, and at the two sides of the gates, there were golden water jugs. These beautiful decorations glorify the opulence of the city. Participating in this great ceremony, all the citizens gathered here and there, dressed in colorful new clothing and decorated with ornaments, flower garlands, and fragrant scents. The houses were all illuminated by hundreds and thousands of lamps placed in different corners of the cornices, walls, columns, bases, and architraves. And from far away, the rays of the lamps appeared to be celebrating the festival of Deepavali, a particular festival observed on the New Year's Day of the Hindu calendar. Within the walls of the houses, fragrant incense was burning, and smoke rose through the windows, making the entire atmosphere very pleasing. On the top of every house, flags were flapping, and the gold water pots kept on the roofs shone brilliantly. Lord Krishna thus entered the city of the Pandavas, enjoyed the beautiful atmosphere, and slowly proceeded ahead. When the young girls in every house heard that Lord Krishna, the only object worth seeing, was passing on the road, they were very eager to see this all-famous personality. Their hair loosened, and their tightened saris became slack due to their hastily rushing to see him. They gave up their household engagements, and those who were lying in bed with their husbands immediately left them and came directly down onto the street to see Lord Krishna. The procession of elephants, horses, chariots, and infantry was very crowded. Some people, being unable to see properly in the crowd, got up on the roofs of the houses. Pleased to see Lord Sri Krishna passing with his thousands of queens, they showered flowers on the procession, and they embraced Lord Krishna within their minds and gave him a hearty reception. When they saw him in the midst of his many queens, like the full moon situated amidst many luminaries, they began to talk amongst themselves. One girl said to another, My dear friend, it is very difficult to guess what kind of pious activities these queens have performed, for they are always enjoying the smiling face and loving glances of Krishna. While Lord Krishna was thus passing on the road, at intervals, some of the opulent citizens, who were all rich, respectable, and freed from sinful activities, presented auspicious articles to the Lord just to offer Him a reception to the city. Thus they worshipped him as humble servitors. When Lord Krishna entered the palace, all the ladies there were overwhelmed with affection just upon seeing him. They immediately received Lord Krishna with glittering eyes expressing their love and affection for him, 
and Lord Krishna smiled and accepted their feelings and gestures of reception. When Kunti, the mother of the Pandavas, saw her nephew Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, she was overpowered by love and affection. She at once got up from her bedstead and appeared before him with her daughter-in-law, Draupadi, and in maternal love and affection she embraced him. As he brought Krishna within the palace, King Yudhishthir became so confused in his jubilation that he practically forgot what he was to do at that time to receive Krishna and worship him properly. Lord Krishna delightfully offered his respects and obeisances to Kunti and other elderly ladies of the palace. His younger sister, Subhadra, was also standing there with Draupadi, and both offered their respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of the Lord. At the indication of her mother-in-law, Draupadi brought clothing, ornaments, and garlands, and with this paraphernalia they received the queens Rukmini, Satyabhama, Bhadra, Jambavati, Kalindi, Mitravinda, Lakshmana, and the devoted Satya. These principal queens of Lord Krishna were first received, and then the other queens were also offered a proper reception. King Yudhishthir arranged for Krishna's rest and saw that all who came along with him, namely his queens, his soldiers, his ministers, and his secretaries, were comfortably situated. He had arranged that they would experience a new feature of reception every day while staying as guests of the Pandavas. It was during this time that Lord Sri Krishna, with the help of Arjun, allowed the fire god Agni to devour the Kandava forest for his satisfaction. During the forest fire, Krishna saved the demon Mayasura who was hiding in the forest. Upon being saved, Mayasura felt obliged to the Pandavas and Lord Krishna, and he constructed a wonderful assembly house within the city of Hastinapur. To please King Yudhishthir, Lord Krishna remained in the city of Hastinapur for several months. During his stay, he enjoyed strolling here and there. He used to drive on chariots with Arjun, and many warriors and soldiers used to follow them. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the third volume, second chapter of Krishna, Lord Krishna in Indraprastha city.